Hey guys, welcome to session one of our ownership class that we call Six Tensions of a Healthy Church. In session one, we're going to be looking at this concept of being diverse yet unified. Diverse but unified. We're going to look at three things uh, in this session and try to come out of this with these objectives. The first learning objective is um, this. We want to um, put this the diversity, which is a, a phrase or a word thrown around a lot in our culture, um, has some uh, particular significance and meaning in the Bible that's different than our culture gives it right now. And so uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at diversity as a reflection of heaven, as a reflection of the early church that we see in Acts and in some other places in the Bible. And diversity is a testimony to the power of the cross, to the uniting power of the blood of Christ. So uh, objective one, diversity uh, is a reflection of heaven, the early church, and a testimony to the power of the cross. Uh, secondly, uh, we're going to look at this concept. Unity within the church, unity is a non-negotiable inside the church body, but it'll come at a cost. Unity is a non-negotiable inside the church, but it will come at a cost. And then the third objective for this session is all humans default toward comfortable environments, traditions, and routines. So this is sort of a, a reflection objective here that we want to acknowledge that this happens. All humans default toward comfortable environments traditions, and routines. Okay, uh, we should start off by explaining the difference between a tension and a problem. A difference between a tension and a problem. You see, uh, oftentimes these two things are uh, mixed up. They're used uh, as synonyms, and they're not. Uh, a problem, by its very nature, has a solution. So if something's a problem, there is a way to solve it. In fact, we call it a problem because it has a solution. So a problem can be solved. And then when you solve that problem, it goes away uh, or you move on to solving the next problem or what have you. However, this other word that we use, tension, is not something that uh, is finite and that has a solution. A tension actually is two opposing or competing things that pull at one another. And you don't solve a tension, you manage a tension because you have to find the right uh, amount of each of the give and take of both sides of these competing values or con competing interests. So uh, we want to, to talk through that idea because we're teaching a class on managing tensions, not solving problems. And so uh, the first thing to note in the entirety of the six sections of this class is that a problem can be solved, but attention must be managed. And that's what we're going to talk about in each of our sessions is how to manage tensions, not necessarily solve problems. All right. Now, with that in mind, uh, let's move on and talk a little bit about why we even teach a fairly in-depth class for ownership. So, so, so why do that? I mean, if you think about, actually, even the name ownership is interesting because in most churches, they would probably call this a membership class. We call it an ownership class. Uh, we, we believe that um, members have rights, but owners have responsibilities. And we also have a much more in-depth class, I think, than, than many churches would have. Uh, this is going to take multiple sessions. It's going to take some time and some reflection and some commitment to get all the way through. Uh, we're doing that because we tremendously care about the culture of our organization. Now, culture is another one of those interesting words that's used a lot. And so uh, we should probably talk about that. The culture of an organization, uh, we'll, we'll define this and then I'll kind of get into it. The culture of an organization is the collection of values, expectations, and practices that guide and inform 
the actions of all members. Okay, this is a, actually a, a formal definition of the word. An organizational culture is the collection of values, expectations, and practices that guide and inform the actions of all members. Now, let me tell you some story, a story that will kind of help uh, and, and maybe clarify a few things. All organizations, uh, churches and secular organizations and anything, they all have a culture. Now, sometimes that culture is a byproduct of very intentional work. Sometimes that culture is practically accidental, but they still have a culture. We still have a collection of values and practices and expectations that guide and inform an organization. Now, we've probably all experienced an organization that states something about their culture. Um, we probably all worked in a secular job at one point or maybe many secular jobs and they had uh, a mission statement or a, a list of uh, values or something like that up on the wall. And if we got to know that organization and then we went and read those values, they don't necessarily align. In fact, sometimes it's almost comical how poorly they align. You read 17 values about an organization and you start chuckling like we don't actually believe any of those things. We, we put those on paper, but we don't live those out. You know, there's a very interesting uh, podcast that has impacted me greatly in my ministry, and it was by Ray Orland Jr. and Sam Albury. And in season one of that podcast, uh, it was called You're Not Crazy, Gospel Sanity for Young Pastors. They talk about this idea that uh, churches have gone through. You know, in the early, mid, even really late 90s, uh, there was a big movement in the evangelical circles in America to get back to what we would call gospel-centered church. It's a very big movement. And so a lot of churches, maybe even the majority of evangelical churches in that time frame, took a great deal of time and effort to rewrite a lot of their doctrinal statements, their uh, theological stances, to ensure that they were being very uh, specific, that they were all about the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things that Ray Ortland points out is that for as much as a huge number of churches did this uh, in that time period and, and wrote out uh, gospel-centered doctrinal statements and, and things on their website or, or um, for their members, there was not nearly as effective of a movement of gospel-centered culture that was actually growing up inside those churches. It was one thing to write it on paper or put it on the website. And it was a whole nother thing to have to live that out. And there are some interesting examples, right? So we would call the, the doctrinal statement in, in the religious world, we call that your orthodoxy and uh, how you're actually living out those things, your orthopraxy. And so we are really good at orthodoxy and not so good at orthopraxy. And I think you and I can even relate to that. Uh, it's one thing to be able to say something like, yeah, I really believe this. Or, yeah, I, I'm, I totally want to live this way. And then actually living that way is a whole nother matter. Uh, we probably only need to look as far as our, our health, you know, how we eat and, and how we exercise and our self-discipline to know we can say one thing and, and do another. <clears throat> well, that's mattered in churches a lot. Uh, one of the great examples of that is, you know, if we... We all probably have known somebody, and maybe we are that person who's gone through something devastating in our life, maybe a major moral failure, uh, maybe there was a broken relationship, uh, divorce, lost a child, uh, went through an affair. I mean, just something devastating where where we really felt the shame of being a failure. Well, um, you know, for a lot of people, they disappear from church when that happens, and we don't see them hardly at all. And you know, for those of us in church. We would have pointed to the, per the the fault being on that person, like man, they misunderstand our church. You know, we we were here to love on people and help people, and man, they should have brought those hurts back in here. But what Ray Orland points out in his podcast is that really the fact that they don't feel like they can bring those things into our church and walk with us in that mess and and in woundedness and that really signals that they don't feel safe with us, meaning that something that we've done or not done, whether uh, what we've said out loud or just the way we've behaved ourselves or the tone or, or our reactions in the past, something has sent a message to those who are wounded or who have messed up or, or feel shame. They can't bring that into our church. And so what he's saying is there's now a gap, right? We, 
we look, we say we're gospel centered, which Jesus was friend of sinners. Jesus was about uh, going to the least of these in their mess and loving on them and calling them to repentance and love. And yet at the same time, while we say that, a lot of our churches don't reflect that. And so that's on us. That's on each of us to figure out what, is, what do we have to do then to change the culture of our church to more adequately reflect this, the, the stated values of our church. And that's why culture matters. That's why culture matters. You, if you're part of our church at all, in any, in any capacity, actually contribute to the culture. Now, you may contribute to the really positive parts of the culture that we really want. You may contribute to some of the negative parts of the culture, but every one of us that's part of an organization contributes to the culture of that organization. And so one of the things that we want to spend some time on in session one is ensuring that you understand not only what our, our stated culture is as a church, but what, what where our heart is as leaders inside the church so that hopefully we can continue to align our culture in one direction. We can continue to move in the same direction, the same heart when it comes to the culture that we want to build inside Resurrection Church. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Um, since we've been talking about culture and we've been talking about the, the tone or the lived out culture in our organization, um, we are going to uh, do a little group discussion. Okay, so what we're going to do is you're going to take your handout and you're going to write out three things that describe our church and they're your personal things. Maybe, maybe they're, uh, maybe no one else agrees with you. Maybe no one else would pick that. Ah, doesn't matter. Maybe they're unique to our church. Maybe they're not. Maybe that's something that a lot of churches share. It, it doesn't matter. It's just the three things that really stand out to you about resurrection church. You're going to write those down. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pause the video coming up here. We're going to pause the video and um, you're going to take those three and in your group, you're going to, sit and discuss with other group members what they wrote down, what you wrote down, why, and then talk about why that, that matters. Maybe those are really good things. Maybe they're bad. Maybe they're neutral. It doesn't matter. You're just going to get some time to talk about what stands out to each of you inside the group about the church uh, and discuss those things. And so uh, this is where you pause this video and take a little bit of time in your group to write those down and then talk through them. Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, hopefully that was a good discussion. Uh, you got to share some things about your observance of uh, the church and its culture. Uh, one of the purposes of this class, and I want to put this up on the screen here. There we go. One of the purposes of the class is to steer our church culture. So we want to shape our church culture very intentionally by teaching the things that we prioritize in a biblical manner. So what you're going to see throughout this class, through all of the sessions, through the group exercises, uh, through the group discussion, through the reflection exercises, is we are being very intentional about steering not just what we're saying, but how each of us are living these things out personally and in the corporate context of our church in a very biblical manner because we're prioritizing them. We, we believe they're very important. And so... Uh, we just want you to hear that, like, this is on purpose. Um, the things that we're going through are not accidental. Uh, we want to shape the, the culture of our church. We, we want a gospel-centered church, a gospel-centered church that lived out, not simply in word, but in deed. Okay, a couple things about this class. Um, in terms of format, uh, this class will include a uh, lecture, which is what you're watching now, me talking uh discussion which are discussion questions both during the video and then after the video and then reflection which is kind of like homework it's just time uh where you, maybe you get a little more more time to process some of what we're teaching uh to read through some scripture to pray and to consider uh some of the things that we're teaching and that we hope that you learn and so you're going to get lecture discussion and reflection as part of these sessions we Hope that they are edifying to you and encouraging. And again, our, our hope is to shape and steer the culture of our church by doing this. So in session number one, as we look at Diverse But Unified, we're actually going to touch upon two of the three Resurrection Church distinctives in this session. And so it'd probably be a good idea to look at those right now, remind you what uh, two of those three distinctives are, and then we'll get into 
why we're covering them and how we're covering them uh, in a bunch of Bible verses tonight. So here is the first uh, distinction or distinctive. The first distinctive is that we at Resurrection Church will be a cross-generational church that raises the next generation, a cross-generational church that raises the next generation. So what that means for us is that we're going to represent a lot of different generations uh, from infants to babies to kids to teens to young adults to all sorts of generations all the way through to our oldest saints. But that across that spectrum, each generation is going to be looking back at a generation or more before them uh, or that are coming after them younger than them and purposefully intentionally investing in those younger generations from them in order to help pull them forward so we're all looking to younger generations no matter what your age is there's someone in the church younger than you and you're looking toward those generations in order to invest in them in order to help raise them up and create opportunity and leadership with them so that's distinctive one distinctive two that we will cover in this session is that we at Resurrection Church will be a will be intentionally multicultural. We'll be intentionally multicultural, and we'll kind of delve into what that looks like and why it matters and why the Bible says it matters in a healthy church. So cross generational raising the next generation and intentionally multicultural. So what I want to do is look at an example of some of the problems that diversity. Well, just being different from one another caused in the early church. Uh, so the first one that we're going to look at is in Acts 6, and this is actually a ethnic diversity that creates a problem in the early church. And so uh, it's so interesting that the church has not been around for very long at all by Acts 6. In fact, it has just recently been formed. And everything seems like it's going fairly well in the first couple of chapters. People are, are coming to Christ. They're sharing with one another. They're eating. They're fellowshipping. They're worshiping the Lord together. Um, they're selling property in order to help each other and the poor. And then by Acts 6, we already have a problem. So to read with me here, we'll start in Acts 6, verse 1. It says this. It says, Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. That's of food. Acts 6, 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Okay. What, what's going on? Uh, church is just formed, and uh, they would go to the poor, the widows, the orphans, uh, those that were the least of these. They would distribute food. Uh, we see that actually even earlier in Acts. And by Acts 6, there's a group, the Hellenists, that are a different ethnic group inside Judaism. And they come and report to the disciples and complain that there is basically discrimination that is occurring and that the widows who are of this Hellenistic group are being basically shorted or ignored entirely when it comes to distributing food. And so um, the we use the term uh, racism a lot in our culture for lots of different things. And I think this is probably what we would look at and call uh, racial bias, right? Or ethnic bias. This is overt uh, ethnic bias, meaning that it is pretty easy to see that there is ethnic bias occurring. Uh, and it's not uh, a defensible claim, right? So as soon as the disciples realize that it's going on, they, they, they address it. Uh, they address it by going and finding seven men of good repute, of good reputation, and putting them in charge of ensuring that this does not happen, that this type of favoritism or discrimination does not continue. So they address it very quickly. Um, most of us consider racism or uh, overt ethnic bias to be uh, wrong, to be sinful. Uh, the Bible certainly calls it sinful. We would call it wrong in our society as well. However, the Bible is going to go a lot further than simply looking at some a situation like this where there is overt racial bias, uh, ethnic bias. 
Uh, it's going to go even further than that. And so we're going to look at a couple more stories where it actually takes us to a whole nother level, a standard that is not really seen in our culture at all that was seen in the first century, which if you know anything about the first century in Palestine or in, in areas around Jerusalem, uh, this this is pretty revolutionary. So let's go and look uh, at another story uh, real quickly. I think you'll like this one. Oh, here. There's your point. Ethnic bias was a problem in the early church, and the church did not tolerate it. Okay. So uh, here is your question. I'm going to actually let you break for a second and discuss this, and then we'll jump into another story that's going to be kind of interesting in the Bible. And that is this question that you will just talk about as a group. And that's, is ethnic bias still a problem in the church today? Is ethnic bias still a problem in your church today? And uh, I'd like you to discuss that. I'd like to, I'd like you to share with your group members uh, what you think about that. Since it was clearly a problem in the early church, uh, is it still a problem today? And so we're going to go ahead and uh, pause this video briefly, and you guys can talk about that for just a minute, maybe not too long, and then come back to me as soon as you're done. All right. Welcome back. I hope you had a good discussion. Uh, let's talk about a few statistics in the church. And uh, I think these will be interesting to you that we're going to hop back into the Bible and take a look at a story in Galatians uh, about some of these same issues. So uh, most of us believe racism is wrong. Uh, we would call it a sin. We would say it's wrong. And most of us probably don't consider ourselves racist. Uh, I, I, I've rarely met someone who considers themselves racist. So uh, by nature, I would submit to you that most ethnic bias is no longer really overt. Uh, rather, it's probably a little more subtle, and it's probably a little more of a blind spot. And I want to show you that in some statistics. And then I want to read another story and where we're going to see how I think some of the ethnic bias and the diversity inside the church kind of comes back to bite us sometimes. Uh, let's talk about this study. While things have gotten better, even inside the church and in the United States, uh, really only a few years ago, we did a study that said that yeah, this was in 2013, 16% uh, of uh, white Americans still do not approve of interracial marriage. That's one, it's about one in every six Caucasian people uh, in the United States, don't approve of interracial marriage. That's in 2013, right? So that's not 1950, 1975. That's in 2013. Um, there was another survey that was run, a different survey that said uh, that while things have gotten a little bit better, uh, that there are 14% of the American population, of the non-Black population in the United States, would not approve of a relative marrying a black person. Now, fourteen percent is still a, a pretty substantial number. Uh, you know, not one in six, but cl close to one in six still. And then there was a poll in uh, twenty eighteen, so even more recent than the last one, that twenty eight percent of. So we're going to divide this a little bit differently. Twenty eight percent of Republicans and twelve percent of Democrats think interracial marriage is not just inadvisable in some vague sense, but that it is morally wrong, morally wrong. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Those statistics are roughly the same, whether the person answered that they were in, they were a churchgoer or they weren't. So the statistics of about one in six people uh, believing that interracial marriage is wrong, would not advise a relative to marry an African-American person, uh, believe it's morally wrong. I mean, those are consistent across even people inside evangelical churches in the United States of America. Now, I don't know about you, but th those statistics blew me away. I, I was I was absolutely blown away with them. Um, let me let me show you, though, where this this concept of, of being impacted by diversity and, 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 and thinking differently, looking differently, maybe having sort of not overt, but like subtle ethnic bias uh, really affected someone in the early church. OK, so we, we read the story about like overt, like we're just discriminating against these widows because we don't like them because they're of this ethnic group. and We're not going to feed them, which is crazy. Right. 
Let me read you a more subtle one. And this is in Galatians 2, 11 through 14. Uh, check this out. All right. It says, but when Cephas, that's Peter, by the way, the apostle Peter, disciple of Jesus, when Cephas came to Antioch, I, and this is the Apostle Paul writing this uh, to the church in Galatia, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Verse 12, for before certain men, uh, before, before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Keep going. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing, uh, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Okay, uh, some context, because maybe that's a little bit tough to understand. But Peter... In Acts 10, was told by God that Gentiles were, were open to salvation, that, that the salvation was for everyone. Peter's led to the centurion. This is the whole story. He's on the roof, and he has a nap, and God comes to him in a dream. And is basically telling him in a bunch of symbolism that there's a lot of ceremonial law from the Old Testament that's gone away because of Christ, but also that the mystery of the gospel, it's for everybody. It's not just for the Israelites. And so he goes to the centurion's home, and everyone accepts Jesus. Now, Peter knows this because it happened to Peter. But here we are in the book of Galatians, and the apostle Paul has realized that what's happening is Peter was engaging Gentiles with the gospel and in his life until there was some public pressure from some Christians that were still kind of holding. They call them the circumcision party. They're holding to some Old Testament law that they shouldn't have been. Um, Paul corrects that too. And they were putting peer pressure on others to not associate with Gentiles because in the Old Testament that used to be ceremonially unclean. And so that pressure causes Peter to start treating different ethnic groups differently and basically excluding them from his personal life. Now, here's what I want you to catch here. He's not treating them necessarily different at church. He's treating them differently personally. Can you imagine Peter's potential excuses? If he, he ends up listening to Paul and being rebuked and taking it and accepting it. But he could have ex, he could have responded like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, racist. I'm not um discriminating against them. I'm not doing anything wrong. They're just not in my friend group. You know, they're just I just don't have any close friends that are this way. Like I'm not ignoring them at church. I'm not treating them any differently. I'm just not spending time with them. What the Bible is showing us here is a very high standard. It's telling us it's not enough to like just treat someone the, the same at church or from afar. It's saying like if anything would impede you from putting your arms around people because they're different than you, that's not walking in step with the gospel. That's that's what Paul's saying. You're not walking in step with the gospel if you're treating people differently. That's a very high standard. Um I, now, Peter accepts this rebuke, uh, but I would just say, and and I'm going to leave this for a discussion thing that you may do post-session. Um, boy, I, I think that we can think of maybe some equivalent scenarios where we're not being overtly racist or biased, but like there's some subtle things that we're doing where we have a group of people that we're comfortable with and a group of people that maybe make us feel a little bit less comfortable. And so... Uh, we find ways in our personal lives to kind of exclude them, not on purpose. We just don't engage them with the gospel. That's what Peter's doing, right? He's just not engaging them in his personal life with the gospel. And Paul comes and calls that out. That is an uncomfortable standard in the Bible. Uh, and yet we're called to that, right? Um, we're called to embrace that diversity and that difference with the gospel and be unified in it. Okay, let me give you another area of diversity where we might be different and yet we're called back into unity. Um, if you have an opportunity uh, afterwards, I'll have you go and read through first Corinthians chapter uh, 12 and uh, 
primarily verses 12 to 20, and then Ephesians 4, 2 through 5. Okay. Um, those are going to be good. But there's a, if, if there's an interesting conflict in scripture, it's not a conflict, but it looks like one, where if you, if you turn to 1 Corinthians uh, 14, it has this entire explanation of how services should be run that, that Paul writes to the church in Corinth because, frankly, they're having some problems um, and disruption, disruptions in their services. So he writes out this kind of whole litany of how a service should be run. And he basically is telling them, look, it's not supposed to be crazy. It's not supposed to be super loud. It's not supposed to be chaotic. Now, that's what he's telling him. Uh, we'll kind of debate whether or not that's for every single church. But, you know, it's not supposed to be a di disorderly. And so it's it's very measured, right? He kind of lines up what the service should look like. But then if you turn to Second uh, Samuel, where is that? Six. You'll see the King David when he's coming back in with this procession of the Ark of the Covenant. And they're praising God and they're like blowing horns and they're making all this loud noise and they're playing drums and he's dancing, uh, potentially naked or close to naked. He's dancing, praising God in his dance, come to this procession. And his wife, uh, Michael, gets really angry at him and basically like chastises him. And he looks at her and is like, yo, you, your heart is in the wrong place. Like I'm just praising God. How? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to put those two scenarios together, right? Like this orderly service that Paul's trying to talk to the Church of Corinth about and this crazy wild like dance party that, that David's doing to celebrate the Ark of the Covenant. What, what it pushes us towards is this maybe uncomfortable point that worship styles can be very different. There is a diversity in how we worship God with with voice, with, with song, with instrument, with dance. Uh, and there are, if we're being really honest, there's probably a way, a preference for each of us where we feel the most comfortable worshiping God in song and in praise. And then there's probably ways that we feel much less comfortable. Now, the tendency we all have is to look at the less comfortable, the things that make us more uncomfortable and say, those things are wrong or at least wrong for me. And they're uncomfortable and maybe even like kind of chastise people for doing those things. And then to look at the way I do it and go, this is the right way. Um, and yet, what we're going to see is that um, God often puts those of us together and forces us uh, into one body in order to worship the Lord together and to do life together uh, and to be stretched and grown in the course of those differences. Uh, how do we manage the diversity of worship styles? I think it's such a great question to ask, right? How do we manage wanting different things. And we struggle with that even at our church, trying to make sure we have a blend of different types of music and styles of music on different Sundays at different times that is inclusive to everybody. Uh, maybe there's a traditional hymn. Maybe there's contemporary worship. Maybe there's acoustic days or Americana. Maybe there's a choir some days. We have actually a lot of diversity in our worship style at our church in order to try to, to get to all of those generations because we want to be cross-generational in order to make sure we engage different age groups. Um, so we're embracing that diversity and that difference when it's very natural for us to kind of push back on the things that are different and want to pull in the things that make us feel the most comfortable. Uh, the old joke that is told around pastoral circles uh, and has been for years is the congregant comes out of a service and sees the pastor after uh, church and says, pastor, I didn't really enjoy worship today. And the pastor's like, well, man, it's a good thing we weren't worshiping you then. Uh, that's a joke, but uh, it's intended to uh, highlight that it's very easy for us to find things that we don't like about church. Uh, and usually when we find things we don't like, it's because they're different than the thing that we would like, uh, not because they're necessarily wrong. All right, uh, let's take a look at this together. This is Ephesians 4, 2 through 5, and uh, we're also going to read 1 Corinthians 12, 2 through 20 together. So if you have that 
in your handout or in your Bible. I want you to go ahead and open that up. I'm going to read it, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. First, we'll start 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12 through 20 first, and then we'll do Ephesians. And I just want you to, to hear these. This is the tension of session one, okay? This is the, the tension of diverse but unified, and it's right here in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20. For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, then it would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would it be the sense of hearing? If the whole body, <coughs> excuse me, if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Okay, what is that saying? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20 is saying, we are different man we are different we're different people different talents different spiritual gifts different interests uh, different desires different things that make us feel comfortable we are different okay and yet we're one body now i want you to see this next part this is in ephesians and i want you to think about how different the different parts of the body are how unique some of the different parts of the body all are now read together as a group ephesians 4 two through five. This is what that says. It says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. What are these verses saying? They are saying no, that you are intended to be very different and very diverse, and yet unified as one in your differences. Now, that's tough, because here's what we tend to do, one, one thing or the other, okay? We tend to either say, I want people to agree with me. In order to be united, they have to agree with me. And so things tend to get really homogeneous, right? where people think like me, act like me, vote like me, uh, maybe look like me. I mean, just I, the more they're like me, the more our interests align, the more our opinions align, and I feel comfortable with that. And that's easy to be united now because we're so much the same. Or we're very different. And those differences actually seem like they create conflict. And those differences are like, man, I don't that's, know if I want to be around this because I'm uncomfortable. And the Bible's saying, no, 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 look, really different and unified. We're going to pull those things together. Now, churches historically have done such a terrible job of this. I mean, we're, we're reading through scripture where it was occurring almost as soon as the, the church was formed. I I could tell you a lot of stories about this. Uh, I could tell you about the, the, the traditions and things that people hold to and they, they become preeminent in, in their life. I, 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 can, I can tell you about the we've all met someone that holds to a tradition and the tradition has become more important than the reason for the tradition in the first place. Um, let me tell you this uh, outside the Bible, we have figured this out in organizations in, in the secular world, when it comes to productivity and efficiency, uh, we have absolutely figured out that, uh, diversity is a good thing. So we've done the organizational behavior studies in now in, in American, um, corporate world and in just capitalism in general and diverse teams where I take a team made up of different people with different backgrounds, different education systems. They think different. <clears throat> when I put diverse teams together, they almost always outperform homogeneous teams, T teams where everyone thinks the same, comes from the same background, uh, uses the same filters tend to uh, drop into this idea called groupthink, where they just sort of echo things back and forth. There's no challenging the status quo. There's no sta challenging the ideas. They all just sort of immediately agree on things fairly early. You actually need some tension. You need some diversity and some disagreement to, to sharpen things. I mean, the Bible would say iron sharpens iron. 
And we know in the secular world that diversity actually improves the performance of teams because of that conflict, that tension that sharpens one another ends up getting a better result than homogeneous teams do. Uh, and yet it's actually easier to be diverse in the business world than it seems to be in the church world. Martin Luther King's famous quote that the most segregated hour in America is 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. Basically, uh, we tend to not do a good job with diversity in the church, even though we can do it in other places. All right. Why does this matter? Uh, well, it matters because it's a picture of heaven. It matters because it's a picture of heaven. And I'm going to show you that as well. In heaven, things are going to be quite diverse. And uh, we're intended to attempt to live out kingdom purposes in heaven here on earth, even though we'll never actually get all the way to heaven. Um, Revelation 7, 9 looks like this. <clears throat> After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, and bef standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in the white robes with palm branches in their hands. The picture of heaven is multicultural, multinational, multilingual. Different, different tongues, different languages, different people, different backgrounds, all surrounding the throne. It is a testament to the power of Christ, the power of his blood from the cross, that people with different backgrounds are called together into unity in the church. And we're supposed to be modeling that, and it's hard to do. Um, point six in your handout is this, um, and we, I do want to differentiate between these things. We, we talk about different types of issues, <clears throat> especially when they're doctrinal issues in the church. And we're going to talk about <clears throat> closed-handed issues and open-handed issues. Now, closed-handed issues are of such significance that uh, we can't disagree without breaking fellowship. Uh, for us, most closed-handed issues deal with the uh, what we would call salvific issues, issues of salvation, uh, issues about the character and attributes of God. There might be a few closed-handed issues uh, that are not of those two subjects, but that tends to be, they're, they're of the primary, maybe se sometimes secondary importance in doctrinal issues. Open-handed issues, on the other hand, are those that we, we don't hold so tightly to. We believe there's some interpretation in that issue, and you can be seen in different ways. And having a disagreement on an open-handed issue is not a reason to break fellowship. So open-handed issues are non-essential. Therefore, we are okay to disagree on an open-handed issue and remain in fellowship. Uh, we will, especially in the last session, talk through each of our closed-handed issues and doctrines, uh, which leaves uh, most everything else as an open-handed issue where we're free to see them differently, to believe them differently, uh, have a different style or interpretation of an open-handed issue. And so it's important. Um, diversity matters in the church. Diversity matters because you can't raise up the next generation without being diverse. The very fact that you want to bring up a different generation means that they're different. So raising up different age groups means they're going to be different. And we can't, as we are become the older generations, tell younger generations they have to be just like us in every way. They're not. They're different. But if we want to reach them for Christ, if we want our church to be able to pass the baton down to generations who, uh, as we raise up godly men and women, and we, we give them the authority, the power, the position in the church to lead the church. <clears throat> We're going to have to embrace the fact that there are differences. And the generational issue is a massive issue in the church. Um, it's getting worse every year. Uh, churches across America are aging out and dying. Uh, depending on the statistics you, that you look at, between 66 and 75% of teens leave the church as soon as they have an opportunity to. And the moment they do, they're they're bombarded by new world views um, in college or right after high school. And, and if they've not been integrated and rooted into the church and, and as a member of the body, a diverse member of the body, they will not stay. And we're seeing that. Um, more than 50% of all, <laughs> maybe more than 50% of all evangelical Christians in the United States are over the age of 55. In 2008, that number was only 33%. We're dying. Evangelical Christians are getting older. 
uh, the majority of us are getting older. We're not raising up the next generation at the rate that we need to. And that's on us to change. And that means we better be really good at understanding what's essential and what's not essential and focusing on the essential things and building a culture that embraces the diversity of our age groups, the demographic around our church, ethnicities, and everything else. 60,000 or more churches, about 20% of churches in America, <coughs> will likely close in an 18-month period because of COVID. COVID-19 pandemic has brought about a fundamental change in the American church and a fundamental way in the way most Americans attend church. And we have work to do, church, to live out a gospel culture, not just say that we want to be a gospel culture, but to live out a gospel culture in our church, embracing the diversity of the members in our church, of all the different body parts that are part of the body of Christ, holding to the closed-handed issues, but being open to the open-handed issues in order to uh, create an inviting environment for people to come and meet Christ. Uh, there's a quote by Chuck Lawless that says this. It says, A strong church learns from the past while preparing for the future. A church with only young generations will sometimes push, push unwisely in the wrong directions. A church with only older folks, on the other hand, will ultimately die. Strong churches connect the generations. We have to connect generations. So in summary, uh, you're going to have some really great group discussion questions to work on. You're going to have a couple days worth of uh, reflection exercises, some neat articles that we found, um, some stuff to, to think through this week. Uh, in summary, number one, diversity is a reflection of heaven, the early church, and a testimony to the power of the cross. Unity is a non-negotiable inside the church body, but it will come at a cost. And lastly, all humans default toward comfortable environments, traditions, and routines. Appreciate you guys joining us. I can't wait for you to discuss this in your groups and have a great time this week as you reflect and read some of these articles. Thanks, guys. You see you in the next session. <laughs>